Dr. Jerry Bell, and uh, I consider Dr. Jerry Bell uh, the premier geocentrist. And uh, I started to cut my teeth on geocentrism because of him and Walter Vanderkamp. And uh, that's why he's here today. And he's just going to uh, expand on what Dr. Bennett just talked about because he's going to talk about the biblical firmament as well, but in a slightly different way, about the, the composition of it, the structure of it, and how we can use that in our cosmology. Okay. Dr. Bell, you need a few minutes? See if this works okay. I need three hands. One to control the mouse and one to flip pages and one to hold the microphone. <coughs> um, you won't know when. <laughs> now, now, now. <laughs> um, I don't know, could this be put up somewhere on a, on a stand or something? The microphone. Probably not. All right. All right. Well, I'll, I'll have fun running both. Um, if we can switch the mouse left-handed, I can do that too. Then I won't have to. S um, no, I actually want it left hand. I need to change it over to left hand. I can do it. I can do the mouse and the desktop stuff, but it, but I'll do it the wrong way if it's on the wrong side. Can you do that? Maybe? Uh, no. Okay. So you would rather have it changed to one? Well, hang on. Well, hang on a second. Yes. Sir. I think what I'll do is. We're ready. Okay. Uh, they always tell you that I'm supposed to uh, uh, tell you what I'm going to tell you first. Uh, that adds five minutes to my presentation. So I think I'll kind of skip that. Um, I will summarize what I'm going to tell you in a, in a more abstract way. Right. First of all, some definitions. These are working definitions I have, okay? They, um, uh, they're words I'll use, and this is what I mean by it. <coughs> uh, space. Room needed for our existence. It can be full, or it can be empty, any kind, okay, I'm not saying anything about its contents. A void. A space with no substance in it through which light and matter can only travel as particles. So in other words, this is a perfect vacuum. A plenum, an infinitely dense, plentifully filled medium pervading all space. The, it's the opposite of void. It means it is fully full. You can't put anything more into it. 
infinite density, in other words. Okay. Is this omnidirectional? No. All right. It's all those singers, you know, who bring the microphone up next to their mouth. <laughs> That's what they make them for. Okay, ether, a rare medium pervading all space which allows light to travel as a wave in the void. Finally, the firmament, a created finite plenum that is indistinguishable from a plenum, I should say an inf uh, a finite medium that's indistinguishable from a plenum to atomic matter. An energy that, a and energy, it acts as a shield to protect us from God's plenum properties. And just quickly, exponential notation because we're going to have large numbers here. Okay, 10 to the negative 3 would be 0 .001 okay, and so forth. And down there, uh, that's a typical number we will run into, into is 2 times 10 to the negative 5, and that's 2 100 thousandths. So it's decimal, and minus is decimal, and then four zeros, and finally in the fifth, the 2. All right, I think you're all familiar with that, so... Okay, well, this, is the this title is, uh, is the Biblical Firmament, so I have to start with some Bible and tell you what it says about the firmament. <coughs> this is about it. There's not much more in Scripture. There's a bit, but not much more. Okay, and God said, let the there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters, which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, gird up your mind, folks. I'm going to strain your credulity, okay? I'm really going to strain your credulity. Because I'm going to talk about some different things. I'm going to talk about a void and a plenum. I'm going to talk about nothing and everything. I'm going to talk about genuine and counterfeit realities and why we're all here, incidentally. And I don't mean the purpose of this conference. I mean more general than that. All right, so let's start with nothing. Have you ever started with nothing before? <laughs> all right. Imagine absolute nothing. Okay. Now, if you think you've got uh, your picture of nothing, now imagine yourself not there. <laughs> All right. um, we, we could say, for example, uh, well, nothing might have some properties, like size, if size is zero. Uh, power, no power, right? Intelligence, no intelligence. Can nothing exist? No, it doesn't, can't exist. It has no existence properties. All right. How big is nothing, all right? Is it zero? No. If the size of nothing is zero, you assume it has an a, a size attribute. Nothing can't even have an attribute of size, let alone actually have a size. <laughs> the same with power. Saying that power is, uh, has, is values is zero assumes that nothing has an attribute power that you can say that for. You can't do that. How about intelligence? Nothing can't be aware of its surroundings. It can't even have the property of intelligence. And finally, existence. Since it can't have any properties, it cannot have the property of existence. All right? So, nothing is impossible. It is literally impossible. You cannot get anything ex nihilo. Sorry, folks. You can't. 
you cannot get anything ex nihilo. It's not, it's not taught in scripture. No. no. In Romans 1, it says it was made by God's power. He, he created something that didn't exist before, I admit yet, but not from nothing. Okay. okay, so if nothing's impossible, what is possible? The inverse of nothing. Yeah, right. Okay. We had these properties before, okay? Size, power, intelligence, existence. The inverse of nothing in size is infinite size. The inverse of no power is infinite power. The inverse of no intelligence is infinite intelligence and <laughs> infinite existence. Right. When we come to size, we have a name for that. We call it omnipresence because the size implies that you're present everywhere. Okay. Power, omnipotence. See where we're going? I intelligence, omniscience, existence, immortal, eternal. All right. Those are all the properties of God, so why don't we just simply call it God? But that is, all right. Might as well. I picked those properties specifically because they are germane to the topic. I did not pick them to prove that God exists. But this is as close as you're ever going to see it. That God, a proof of God that, that God exists. All right, now, the inverse of nothing is God. That's why they say there's nothing before God. Now I want to focus in on omnipotence. Okay, omnipotence, or omnipresence, first of all, I should say. I think I skipped something. Okay, that omnipresent should be omnipotence. All right. Uh, the um, omnipotence should be omnipresent. The logic there is simply, if there were ever a place, a, a present, a, a location, where y there's no power, then omnipotence would not be there. And then, hence, uh, omnipotence would not be omnipotent because it violates the omni of the potence. So, omnipotence must be omnipresent. Now, if we use equals mc squared, because omnipotence and omnipresent, okay, power, it means infinite power, infinite energy in particular also, via equals mc squared, well, forget about the squared, all right? Look at the mass, m. That means that it must have infinite mass. Omnipotence means that you shouldn't have any, any volume of space so small that the power there is not infinite. No matter how sm small a volume you pick, there has to be infinite power in that volume or it's not omnipotent. A medium of infinite density, which is implied by infinite mass, is called a plenum. Okay, that's the classical definition of a plenum. Now I'm going to show you that the plenum was well established by the 5th century BC. Well, what happened in the 5th century B.C.? Well, 
Leucippus proposed atoms in a void. He took that, let's cut a, a volume of space, and you know, smaller and smaller and smaller, and he decided that you, know, you can't keep doing, doing this forever. And so he decided at some point, you must get a volume of space that's empty. In which case, you've discovered the smallest particle, which he called an atom. And the space in which nothing exists, he called a void. Parmenides was of the old school. He defended the planet model. He said, well, look, if you have two atoms and they're separated by a void, a void is nothing. So you're saying the two atoms are separated by nothing. That packs them back together and you're back to a void. There's a certain logic in that. I wouldn't write a PhD thesis on it, though. <laughs> Nor would I hang my fate on it. <laughs> in hindsight, it turns out that Parmenides and Leucippus were both right. But for several centuries, the planet model prevailed. The Greeks finally concluded that, well, you know, the density of lead is 16 grams per cubic centimeter, 16 times the density of water. The density is 16, and we know that if we were encased in lead, we couldn't move. How much less could we move if we were encased in an infinite medium? Well, there's a certain logic in that, too. It's no better than, than uh, the one with Parmenides, is, but that's it. That's how they worked. But the, f the planet model refused to die. It kept going. In the, the 20th century, Bertrand Russell took another look at the plenum idea. And he concluded that motion is possible in the plenum as long as the plenum is uncreated and the motion is cyclical. All right, got the idea? So since nothing can't stand still, right? They can't have the properties of standing still. The inverse must be perpetual motion. That's, that's, the, that's the logic he followed. And the motion must be cyclical, like waves and orbits and rotations. This is actually the basis of Harold Aspen's planet model. Well, Fresnel and Arago showed that light behaved as a wave. This is the early 19th century. That means that there has to be something that carries waves. And that brings up the ether model. So Leucippius's voice could not a void could not be empty. Okay, the ether was invented as an ethereal medium to transmit light waves. It's been problematic since its invention. The history of the firmament, however, starts with this man here, Max Planck, the father of quantum mechanics, of quantum physics. He was a German physicist, and he started to toying around with fundamental constants, in particular a Planck constant, which deals with quantum spins, the gravitational constants, and the speed of light. And he discovered if he rearranged them certain ways, he could come up with some basic units, a basic unit of length of the order of 2 times 10 to the negative 33rd centimeters, really tiny, OK? That's point thirty two zeros and then the 2. All right. A mass of 2 one hundred thousandth of a gram, a time of 5 times 10 to the negative 44 seconds, however that time is interpreted, and a temperature of 10 to the 30 second kelvins. <laughs> That's right. We don't have thermometers for that. Right. 
each one of these is either the largest or the smallest value that can be assumed by that property. The length, that's the smallest size that can be assumed by that. The mass is the largest. You say, well, I may weigh more than ten, 2 to the times 10 to the minus 5th grams. That's true. I do too. But we're talking about fundamental particles. We're not talking about conglomerates of particles. No particle can exceed that mass. Time, well, temperature, nothing can be hotter than that. That's the maximum. Funny things happen when you get, hot, uh, when you get to that temperature or when you get to that mass. In essence, <laughs> Planck discovered a new atom called the Planck particle. It's vastly smaller than any atom that you know of. Vastly smaller than the atoms that make up all the material you and I love. You can define a density for it because you have a mass and a, a volume. And the density is 5 times 10 to the 93rd grams per cubic centimeter. Now that's a big number. That's right. Uh, these particles are densely packed in a medium. If there's any space between them, it is, I don't know what this property would be. Some, some people avoid it by saying, well, it's a crystalline thing, and so that they're cubes, and that's fine. Um, is it real or a deficiency in our physics? The typical thing to say is, well, it's the limit of our physics, and it's not, uh, or it's real. It's not real. The uh, the classical, the, what's m the most common one is it's not real. But I submit to you that this is the firmament. All right, now is the Planck medium the Bible's firmament? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to know two things. Why did God create it? And is firmament the right translation? So let's imagine we're God. Okay? And we want to make something known. Now, Paul puts it this way. He says, what if God, willing to show his wrath, his wrath, and to make his power known, his power, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, first type of vessel, and that he might make known the riches of his glory, of his glory, on the vessels of mercy, mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Now, if you're God, Trinity, right? You know all of all about your wrath, but you can't express your wrath because you can't be wrathful with one another. Right? Um, you know your power, so who are you going to show it to? Right? Um, you know the riches of your glory, so who are you going to show it to? And you know the extent of your measure. You need someone to show it to. For that, then, you have to create mortals. Right? Mortals who are not part and parcel of the plenum. So we have to build something to shield the vessels from God, God's omnipotent properties, or plenum properties. All right, so here's the, here's the firmament. God created the firmament on the second day. I don't want to get into the into the the first day because it goes beyond the scope here and we'll be here all day, all night. <laughs> okay. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. It was so. 
Waters are magical, okay? Pro waters have properties that m other, most other materials do not have. Like, for example, its own solid floats instead of sinking. Okay. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and morning were the second day. So the Trinity knew all these things. All right, so what does, the, uh, what does this mean? Well, these are interpretations of the, of the firmament. The canopy idea is, the, is now uh, discredited. The Earth's crust, well, the stars are in it. The stars don't come in the Earth's crust. Genesis uh, 1, 16 and 17 says the stars are in the firmament. Is it an expanse? Expanse is rather non-committal. It could be solid or it could be a shell. Is it a hollow shell? Well, let's look at the hollow shell model because that's really the most popular one. Is it a hollow shell? Well, there are reasons why people suggest that. One is simply that Moses was brought up in Egypt he was we should ac accept the, the Egyptian people, which is okay, who's a naked woman covering the earth like the dome of a serving dish. But she's all only out at night okay, and doesn't play a typical role with the sun. This is what she actually does is on the first day of spring, she opens up her mouth and the sun on into it and she closes her mouth, swallows it, and the sun is in her body, still going around every day, it's in her body for nine months and then comes out her birth canal on the first day of winter. Then finds his way back to her mouth in the, in, the, in the next quarter of a year. I don't see where the shell model fits in this. <laughs> Besides that, the phenomenon they're talking about is an annual one, it's not a daily one. And there's a lotus uh, blossom one that's, that's kind of close, but the lotus blossom, the sun sails is bark across the sky and, bar and disembarks on the other side and the lotus blossom closes up and submerges into the, into, the, uh, into the abyss, which is full of water. A new sun is born in the lotus blossom and she surfaces and the new sun um, embarks on its bark and crosses the sky and so on. That's the closest I've come to a shell model. In that case, it's made of lotus leaves, or uh, uh, petals. All right, how about the, the translation of firmament? Is it right? Well, it comes from the Latin firmamentum, which means a thing that strengthens or supports. Now, I'm picking here on the old Latin translated, you, um, the he underlying Hebrew as for momentum back in the year 130. 20 years later, Aquila, approximately 20 years, Aquila translated the Hebrew into Greek. And he picked stereoma, means a firm or solid structure. The Hebrew is rakia, from raka, which means to condense, to make firm or solid. And yes, it can me be a, a beaten out expanse. It can be that. But that has to do with the condensed portion of it. Now, all English translations up through the AV, including the Douay Reims, read firmament. 
Okay, add to that the primacy of the plenum universe back in the fifth century BC, and it looks like the original model was a plenum version. So the translation firmament is correct. Okay, so how big is a grain of the firmament? We've seen it already. Planck particle, two times 10 and negative 33 centimeter. Let's enlarge it to a centimeter, like a marble, right, that size. The centimeter would also enlarge and stretch out 12,000 universes at, say, 20 million light years per, per diameter. 12,000, that's, that's pretty small, right? Or if you enlarge it to the, uh, to the size of a hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom would become as big as 10 million Earths laid side by side. Now recall that the density of the firmament is five times 10 to the 93rd grams per cubic centimeter. That's equivalent, well, the universe is said to be roughly 10 to the 56th grams per cubic centimeter. So if you were to pack the entire universe, this room, everybody, the whole creation, if you were to pack that into a, sugar, a small sugar cube size, you'd only reach a density of 10 to the 56th grams per cubic centimeter. You'd have to pack 10 to the 37th universes into that little sugar cube to match the density of the firmament. And people believe that, that the universe is significant compared to that. That's, mind you, that's 10 to the 37th universe masses in one cubic centimeter. It's 10 to the 179th in a 20 million light year universe. Or 10 to the 123rd universes. Well, the essence is that the firmament's the most massive thing created. How can we move through the firmament, though? Remember the Greeks? Well, atomic matter moves in waves through the firmament. That's the density of 93rd grams per cubic centimeter. But as particles through the void, <coughs> the void being the 10 to the minus 30th grams per cubic centimeter as the mean density of space, the vacuum of space. Okay, you understand that? The waves are through the firmament. The firmament is omnipresent. It's everywhere around us. It's inside the atoms. It's inside the nucleus. It's just everywhere. So how can we move through the firmaments? Well, the wavelengths of nuclear particles must be vastly longer than a Planck length. The Compton wavelength of a Planck particle happens to be a Planck length, 10 to the negative 33rd centimeters. The smallest stable particle is a proton, which is 10 to the negative 16. Sub all right. Subtract 16 from 33, and you have 17. That's 17 orders of magnitude about which we know nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, you say, well, well, well Higgs boson, fine. That only takes care of two of them. <laughs> and that's the most massive particle we expect in our physics right now. All right. No nuclear or larger particle really has much of a, a, a chance to ever detect the presence of the firmament. You say, well, the temperature of the firmament is so hot. Yes, but guess how long the wavelength is of that temperature, the Planck length. Also, remember that mass, two times 10 to the negative fifth grams? How fine would you ha how far would you have to compress that one in order to make to reach its its Schwarzschild horizon? That is to make it a black hole. Guess what? A Planck length. All this physics ties together in the material that makes up the firmament. 
Now, light is a transverse wave, because we mentioned, I, I gave you without proof or evidence that particles and light moves as waves through the firmament. Uh, light is a transverse wave. When you look up the speed, when you find the speed of a transverse wave through the firmament using standard density uh, formulas from the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, you find that it is the speed of light to five significant digits. So that light, that Okay, that's the, that's the fastest that a transverse wave can go through the firmament. So there really isn't any need for an additional ether because that's it. The firmament is itself the ether. Now you may on a, there may be you may you may need another one. I'm not sure. Okay, there, are, there might be other levels there, but. Alias is for the firmament, vacuum state, Planck medium, space-time foam, zero-point energy, dark energy, Markov's maximon fluid. All right. One of the problems we have in identifying everything is that everything gets the same thing gets different names depending on who's working on it and what they're doing with it. That's a way. To, yeah, well, that's job security. That's what it is. <laughs> I know how that's played. Did the same thing in in computer science. Aliases for a Planck particle, maximons, mass of superstrings, which are not, not physical because although they have Planck length multiples, their thickness is zero. And that's not physical. Our virtual particles. Uh, the secular view of the firmament, the one that's common now, is it consists of virtual particles. These pop into existence, they exist for a Planck time, there's there come where it comes in, and then pop out of existence. The pro uh, and the problem is that virtual particles are not real. They're virtual. You don't want to call them unreal, because they'll come back and bite you. <laughs> With no real constraints on those virtual particles. Their, their pops, the, the violence of their creation in and their, their disappearance and so on, and just the, the mess that that creates in that space-time foam builds, can build bizarre structures like wormholes, for example. But there's no limit on how, bi how big those can get. But we don't observe them. We don't observe any of these structures. So that means that um, they must be real. There's some real constraint that keeps them uh, in at bay. All right, in summary then. We have a firmament made up of Planck atoms, okay? We, they have certain special properties. I mentioned uh, the Planck length is the black hole size of a Planck mass, okay. the maximum wavelength of Planck temperature, and the Compton wavelength of a Planck particle. A Compton wavelength is the wavelength of a particle when it's at rest. When it moves, its wavelength is called a de Broglie wavelength. The firmament also rules all physics. It's a tyrant. That means, in particular, if the Earth happens to be at the center of mass of the firmament, you aren't going to be able to budge it. No matter what you try, it will change the physics of that puny little material universe to let everybody know that it's in charge. So in essence, it anchors the Earth. The firmament is, bears all wave motions. Hmm? 
It also determines the speed of light. It shields the atomic universe from a plenum, the underlying plenum. That's Parmenides' plenum. We have a 17-order void there in size, not in dimension. That further shields the universe from the plenum. That's a great unknown region. Uh, 17 orders, for example, um, suppose you, to give you an idea, suppose we had, uh, had uh, the Planck um, particle enlarged to one centimeter, okay, a marble. And let's put it at, at the center of the sun. Imagine the sun's not there, but at that position. Okay. 17 order, orders of magnitude larger would encompass most of the orbit of Pluto. That is the size that a proton would take. Or do actually, uh, yes, 17 orders, because you use the proton. Hmm? Now the atomic universe, which gets pictured as lying above the firmament because it's larger in scale, we're not dealing here with a dimension per se, has particle behavior. It's void-like in intergalactic space and corresponds more or less to Leukippus' uh, atomic model. Light behaves as particle and its physics is totally dominated by the firmament. Conclusion, as a created plenum, the Planck medium is the only candidate for the biblical firmament of Genesis. There's no other candidate. It shields the creation from God's fervent heat. And since the firmament rules the physics of the universe, it is the most likely cause of the phenomena that, that physics, quote, seems to conspire. That's one man's description of what you've been listening to today seems to conspire to anchor the Earth at the dynamic center of the universe. Hmm. Now, that basically what that, that person says is physics conspires to make the speed of light okay, the same no matter what direction it comes from around the Earth. It's a conspiracy. There's no reason for it. We all know that the, er that the uh, Earth is moving around the sun. Why should we be special? The Copernican Revolution was thus mistaken in concluding that the Bible need not be believed when it touches on scientific matters. I've never seen it fail. Uh, God challenges jo um, Job to a whole bunch of challenges. Now, some of them I don't know the answer to, but the ones to which I know the answer, God's right on them. The end. <laughs>